a great leader in the Academy of Facial Plastic Surgery. He's, uh, he practiced in Plano, has an unbelievably great practice there. I'm sure he would welcome you to come visit. And particularly all of those who are interested in facial plastic, he would be like the role model of the kind of practice you'd like to have. So Sam is a graduate of Princeton, uh, Baylor, trained with Ed Williams of facial plastic. Uh, he, he's on, I'm on one of the committees that, in the communications and committee where he's worked on our website, the American Academy of Facial Plastic Surgery, and he's done an amazing job. But he's almost single-handedly made all that happen. He uh, has published so many articles, books, he's renowned in the field, highly regarded, highly respected by his peers. And uh, he's going to talk to us today about uh, hair transplantation, which is one of his expertise, an area that we don't really have a lot of uh, experience with here. So I think you'll find this very interesting. Thank, you, thank you for taking your time to come. I'm honored to be here, Jim. Okay. Thank you. Um, this lecture will probably run between 40 to 50 minutes or so. It's multiple small lectures. And I was an examiner for the American Board of Facial Plastic Surgery a couple weekends ago, and one of our 12 protocols was completely on hair restoration. So this is relevant um, for your general knowledge base if you're going to go into facial plastic surgery. And I think it's somewhat relevant even if you're in otolaryngology just for boards and things like that. I'm going to talk um, basically first off with general ideas of, of what uh, is going on today to keep you current because you guys don't go to hair meetings I assume. And then I'm going to talk about specifically how you do it from start to, be, start to end. And hopefully my goal uh, is to, to encourage you Oh, let me just stop that one second. Let me just uh, get that yeah. slide down. So okay. Just a little clockwise. Oh, clockwise. You know, leave, leave the light up a little higher because I like to oh, see okay, the faces really? and they can see. Yeah, it's fine. They can see this. Um, part, of, part of my goal is to encourage you that this is fun. Um, this is, yeah, that's perfect. This, this is a lot of fun. And I think that for people that find potentially in their mind that hair can be boring, I want them to say, hey, this actually could be fun after this talk. So here are the, the, the coolest things happening in the field today. Bioenhancement, also known as regenerative medicine, and that's platelet-rich plasma. If I have time, I'll talk a little about that at the end. Um, A-cell, a uh, ATP, liposomal ATP, and hypothermosal. All these things can allow, in a single session, something with a, you know, like a basal cell cancer, very difficult to get this done in one session. But this is one session because I believe a large part of it is good technique, but also you're adding all these enhancement technologies that has, to me, revolutionized the field of hair restoration, allowing hairs to grow better. The, the lay press, I would just say it's like a fertilizer. It helps hairs grow better. Hyaluronidase, you're all familiar with that as in local anesthesia or if you're in cosmetic world to dissolve hyaluronic acid. But this can actually reduce tension on wounds. So I encourage you to maybe even consider how this could be applicable in the facial plastic world or in the otolingologic world. It, can it reduce tension in wounds? It reduces tension when I'm stuck with a little bit of tension on the backside. It reduces tension down considerably in about five or 10 minutes. Um, scalp micropigmentation is another big topic. It's an, a huge adjunct today where you can manage, uh, this is a, a scar, or you can just enhance a hair transplant result with a little bit more just to, to, to improve uh, results. Low laser level uh, therapy has been something that we considered garbage in the past, but it really actually can be extremely beneficial today. And essentially it incites cytochrome C as a, as a pathway mediator to decrease apoptosis and, and, and increase hair cellular regeneration with, with hairs. This is just with no other therapies, just showing a lady that didn't want hair restoration and got a decent result just with laser therapy. And in the last two years, 2013 and 14, there have been some multi-center uh, prospective randomized uh, sham device controlled studies that showed significant efficacy on hair uh, mass index as well as global photography. So it absolutely works. It's a great adjunct. It's FDA clear. To me, it's the third pathway besides finasteride and, and minoxidil in therapy. A big trend in the last year and two years for me has been looking at overplucked eyebrows, that sort of older trend of wanting very th attenuated look, and then people then putting these ugly tattoos on that look fake, and then now just transplanting over that and fixing it. So that's been a, a huge trend in the last few years. Prostaglandin modulators, if people ask, you know, what are, what's the next wave of therapies for, for by the way, sorry, I, I sound like Barry White right now because I had a little post-nasal trip. Maybe one of you guys can help me here. But uh, prostaglandin modulators is huge. You know, you heard about Latisse. 
uh, this it, it's a proscalin alpha F2 agonist. And now that you know Allegan is now doing phase two, phase three clinical trials and looking at the efficacy of this for male pattern baldness. And they're just doing work on trying to get the right dosing. And then they also bought out a, 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 a company called Kythera that has a D2 antagonist, which in some Japanese studies have shown actually uh, if you block D2, you can actually increase hair growth. So very exciting. That's going to be probably an oral uh, supplement in the next few years as well. Female cases, you know, there's a traction alopecia case, but it really have risen in the last few years. I've seen a, a huge trend in, in women wanting hair, hair, hair restoration. And then also uh, ethnicities have increased. And because of this, you know, I have no hair on my face and, you know, a couple of hairs here or there. And so there's, you know, Hispanics, Asians that don't have a lot of hair in particular. They, uh, hair transplants to improve that condition can also be something you don't think about. Um, hair systems or hair pieces, you know, it's, nowadays they're so natural in the frontal area. The problem where they don't look right is in the temporal area. So a large part, you can do temporal transplants in people with hair systems and really make their hair system, system look good. Well, who's a candidate for this? Consider someone with the Norwood 7, extreme baldness. You can't, if they don't have good enough density in the Norwood 7, you're not going to close them. So you can combine a hair transplant with hair systems or stage someone out of a hair system into a hair transplant gradually. And so those are ideas. And also just scar repairs like facelifts that have removed all the, the, the sideburns or temple hair. This is something there too. And of course the biggest trend is FUE. And FUE, you know, as they say, if, 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 uh, if all you have is a hammer, the world is a nail. You know, and, and that is something that I want to give you a little talk about how do you select FUE versus FUT, which is strip procedure. Um, robotic FUE, um, I use it robotic FUE. It's really gone from, I would say, not a great technology to an amazing technology in the last two years. And it's just so many software upgrades and refinements now that it's, 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 it's pretty darn amazing. Um, FUE linear scar repair is an indication for FUE. And then FUE can, uh, you can, I do a ton of beard harvest for people that are burned out donor hair. Um, I don't do a lot of chest, but you can take other sites FUE method because you can't do a strip across the face. And it, believe it or not, beard FUE harvest heals like in a day I can't see the, the donor and they can start shaving. In fact, I encourage them to shave because once they start shaving, it actually um, heals even faster. So let's do some basic um, overview of medical therapy and what hair loss is all about. So I encourage you to study this. I know that this seems basic. It's just a Norwood classification scheme. But if you don't understand this, you want to understand how to do hair. And you know, if you look at a fake rhinoplasty result, you probably across the room can spot it, whereas maybe a colleague that's outside of our, in, our field can't. Well, I was sitting next to a colleague of mine in San Diego that said, hey, I can spot all hair transplant results. I said, well, the guy in front of you has a hair system and the guy at the right of you has a crown transplant. He says, How? they look normal to me. I said, it takes years to acquire the eye. And so you start with the Norwood pattern and you begin to see. I, it took me two to three years before I could even see fake results. Now, you say, well, I can see fake results. Well, I, of course, I could have seen those at the beginning, but it takes time to develop an eye to see patterns that are not natural, subtle patterns. And that, it, it really does. So let's start from the beginning. Donor dominance is, is the, uh, the, the underpinning of all, everything. From the 1950s, Norman Orntreich saw that hairs that are genetically programmed not for loss move to the front will not be lost. And that's the, the, pre, the, the, the basics of how hair works, how tra hair, hair transplant works. Now there's a lot of confounding variables where there's some recipient influences. There can be some thinning in the donor area. So some patients, a small minority, can have some thinning in their transplanted zone from the transplanted hairs. But in the majority, this is how hair works. So what you're fighting now is constant loss of supply and you know dwindling supply and increasing demand. So as a hair surgeon, you have to have a good feeling about do I enough have enough hair, not just today for the problem, but the future? So what does that mean? Particularly problematic is the young patient. The young patient who's 25 years old, who wants a hairline way down here like his peers, who's rapidly losing hair, he's like a nightmare candidate for surgery because he's going to look like, look like a disaster by 35 and 40. And he may not care, but you guys can't project yourself Pick yourself 15 years from now. Whatever that age bracket is, you can't see it. You can't visualize it. So as an ethical physician, you have to look forward and, and, and make sure that person doesn't suffer that way. Um, 
This is just understanding what male pattern baldness is. It's terminal thick hairs going to vellus hairs that become no hairs. So what medicine does, and medicine is an integral component. If you're a hair surgeon, you must understand medical therapy. So finasteride, minoxidil, and laser allows you to take hairs that are, are vellus and move them back toward thick hairs. And even in some cases, when the hairs are gone, and they're not gone, they're, they, even in slick baldness, there's, there is a base of a follicle underneath the skin. In that case, you're not going to get a lot back. So this is why I encourage, really encourage medical therapy when you're young. And I'll talk about that more in a second. But this is a gentleman that just came in yesterday. And he came in in 2013. He's in his early 30s. Um, at the time, late 20s. He balded by 2015, which is the middle slide. And then 10 months of finasteride only. That's a slide yesterday I took. And he forgot what he looked like. He says, you know, I'm still not happy with it. And I said, you know, that's just one medical therapy. So don't forget medical therapy is a take home from this. I'm not gonna get too much in this. You can, you can look this up. But the, 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 this is so important is, is your take home. Don't forget medical therapy. Um, finasteride and, and minoxidil. So finasteride, you know, it's one milligram. The, it, it is a 5-alpha reductase type 2 inhibitor blocks testosterone conversion to DHT. And the biggest thing in the press right now is post finasteride syndrome. You may have read about it. Journal of Sexual Medicine back in 2011 and 12 talked about how patients have protracted and, and maybe forever uh, uh, persistent sexual side effects. In my practice, I really have seen maybe one or two cases, and that's one or two cases that's way too many, right? I understand that. Um, I really believe that a lot of this is most likely not true concrete substantiated evidence because there's not been any peer-reviewed studies that say this is real because the Journal of Sexual Medicine was anecdotal phone call to several patients, about 50 patients, but this is a concern. And so now in, in a litigious society, I have all my patients sign off on this, but if you saw that last slide, wow. I mean, don't just, you know, some patients just say, oh, I re some, read something on the internet and I just stopped. Well, they, what, they had no side effects. And now they've lost this major thing. They've lost like half their hair. So try to sift through some of the, 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 the ideas. I'm not gonna go through the whole history of finasteride and understanding prostate clinical trials, et cetera. It's too much information right now. But just understand there's a wealth of information. If you're gonna be a hair surgeon, you must understand in, in the biodynamics of these products. Minoxidil to me, is, a, is, is incredible. And now 5% as of February 2014 is cleared for women. And the, you, you, wanna use it and you wanna use this as a way to pre, not only limit further loss, and what's interesting is that minoxidil and finasteride are synergistic, so they're not redundant. It, the more, and laser's not redundant. They work through different pathways, and so they help each other. And they've shown studies where someone does med, uh, minoxidil for a long time, stops finasteride, and, and they have a loss, or they add one, it goes up. So, I try to help patients understand this is an important thing. And when there's a lot of those miniaturized vellus hairs, especially in women, those hairs are extremely susceptible to, to shock loss where you start transplanting that and they just shed like crazy. And then some of those hairs may not come back. So you wanna stabilize those hairs to the best of your capacity. And I use minoxidil as a inexpensive, fast way to do things. And that, that's a critical uh, element in your armamentarium as a hair surgeon. Um, and this is good for both genders. The, I do mention that with finasteride or minoxidil that they can have some shedding around four to six weeks from minoxidil and three, to month, three months after starting with finasteride because those hairs are shifting into antigen. Sometimes you see that and if you don't caution the patient, they'll think they're losing more hair and stop. So look at this as a great adjunct to your global therapy for patients with hair loss. It's important that you consider it. Um, and the, the other thing with this is that the foam version is the same efficacy as a liquid, but it, it cuts down the 23% incidence of allergies due to the pro propylene glycol down to about 2 to 3% when you're looking at the foam version, but same efficacy. So I try to help counsel my patients in saying this is not all or none. You know, a lot of people are OCD. If they stop mono minoxidil for a day or two days, they forget it. You know, it's like diet or exercise. If you had fried chicken for three days, okay, let's start eating some, something healthy. If you haven't exercised for a month, let's go back in the gym. This is the same thing as don't make this all or none. Do what you can with your medical therapy. So I divide my consults into red, yellow, and green. Green light is a guy that's 60 years old, has a pretty established pattern of hair loss, and maybe doesn't even need medicine. I'm just gonna talk about surgery. Even 45 years old, probably, I feel pretty confident. But they've got all miniaturized hairs, you know, and they're 30-some. 
they're probably yellow. I really encourage you to do a lot of medicine and maybe not jump to do surgery. If they're early 20s, rapid loss, that's a, that's a red light. You're going to do medicine, 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 and no surgery. And that's a way to help divide your clinical thinking. Operative time flow. This is seeing the big picture. When I, I, I run a course in St. Louis, and the students have always asked me, hey, I can't understand all these pieces, where they fit in. So this is a quick overview. This is obviously a slide that you're not meant to read. This is just from my, my book. Um, I make no money on my books or my courses as a disclosure. Everything goes to charity. So I can say that and encourage you to get it without understanding that I'm not trying to endorse it from a monetary standpoint. So very simple. You set up your room. You prepare the hairline. Um, get the IV started. Draw the PRP. You want to draw your PRP, platelet rich plasma, early on. Uh, heart, this is donor harvesting. This is usually, I'm going to talk about more strip first and I'll talk about FUE. Then you design your sites and then the, the grafts are prepared concurrent to your site design and then the grafts are placed in the afternoon. I'm out of the room by stage five during that, that period of time. Uh, I run a Joint Commission Accredited Surgical Facility, so I like to give them some IV sedation, but you can easily do this under IM. When I'm doing FUE, I do it under IM. So very, very simple formulation. I, by noon, by 1 o'clock, to get them a little sedated and comfortable by the afternoon for the placement, I give them a little bit of an axiolytic as well and some pain control. Um, here's a breakdown more specifically. I think redundancy and education is good, so you can see this again. The PRP is the first thing we draw. Uh, get that IV started. I, I start drawing the hairline. The donor is selected, and then the, the PRP is prepared, spun, centrifuge, and, and ready. I start getting the, the donor harvested, and I take segments out uh, so that the, 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 the ladies in my room can start dissecting and start getting me a graph calculation. I'll explain more of that in just a minute. Um, and then I start designing. And the heart of this talk for me, my passion in hair is recipient side creation. Um, that's what makes this, this job fun. It doesn't make it boring and redundant and stupid where people think, you know, I'm just, you're making little holes. It's, it's really fun. I'm going to show you my design patterns and, and my thinking when, when that goes in the critical thinking that's there. Then graph placement for the afternoon. So let's talk about hairline design, some fundamentals. This is a, a resident level uh, discussion. But you know what? It's so important to really understand how do you draw a hairline, you know? And I have, patient, I, sorry, I have students in my course that draw perfect hairline. They come back and draw it again, and it's, it's totally off because these, these seem easy, but they're, they're not easy. So, you know, the rule of thirds can be a great way to start, but to me it's too simplistic. Um, what I like to do is really look at this shingle point where you're going from a vertical scalp to a horizontal scalp. So any hairline that sits on vertical scalp is artificial, not natural. Okay, now, you're going to look at a couple colleagues with a Norwood 1 and go, I see his hairline here. You're crazy. It, it, it's natural. Yeah, OK, fine. It, it does exist in nature, but you're not going to create one there. Because it's just, if anyone that needs hair restoration should not be getting a hairline on his vertical scalp. It should begin at the shingle point, at that point where it transitions over. And why, why is that? Why can't you just go higher? The reason is that the, 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 the reason to do hair restoration is not just stick hair up there. It's to create a facial frame. Like a chin implant and a facelift creates a lower facial frame. A hair transplant creates an upper facial frame and allows someone to look better. If you just create this receding hair back up here, you put some hair up there, but you haven't done anything of aesthetic value for the patient. So you don't want to go too high. Now, how, how low can you, go? Can, you, can you go? can you go a little higher than this? We're going to talk about that. It really depends on how recessed that hair pattern is. So I created this little idea of communication for uh, as a communication tool, which is thinking of the head like a box. Okay, my head probably looks like a box, but the idea is that it's if you think about vertical and horizontal planes, you can start to understand regions of the scalp. Now, why is this so important? Because when I start talking about recipient site design, it actually has a lot to do with where it is on the scalp. So if you don't know where you're on the scalp, you can't design it. So the hairline is just as we said, vertical to horizontal transition. The crown is just the start point, vertex transition zone. It's just a, a transition from horizontal to vertical scalp. And then the lateral hump, which is the temporal hair, is horizontal to vertical, right? So these are all very easy. If you start thinking of your scalp like a square or a box, you can start to understand the transition zones. And then this is more esoterica, is, is, is how do you design the little shape points of it. But the, the, the key point of this is that the central anterior point, which we discussed, the defined to the shingle point, and the lateral point are the defining elements of a hair transplant. The lateral point is up on the lateral canthus. Okay? We're going to show that more in details in just a minute. So th these are different designs. And this is part of the fun is you know Asians have wider heads, such as mine. 
um, and some people have narrower heads. So you want to create a, a shape that would be ethnically sensitive. African Americans have straighter uh, uh, hairlines. Women have a different shape pattern, have uh, have a rounded. So you want to create the hairline that's appropriate. I'm not going to talk about female hairlines or female hair restoration because it's just too much information for the morning. I'm focused on male. So this is a, a key thing, which is a lot of people think, you know, okay, well you taught me the shingle point. I'm just going to create this hairline way up here. What makes it look like a toupee for untrained eyes is the temple needs to fit where the hairline is. If the hair, temple's back here and the hairline's up here, it looks like a toupee, even if you've got the best hair system in the world. So you need to have the hair and the temples match. For me, that's a dead giveaway of a hair transplant if the temples are too far recessed vis-a-vis -vis where the hairline is positioned. Here's a big thing. When I look at lateral positions of hairlines, they've got to go up a little bit or flat. Flat is more aggressive, down is feminine. So this is a mistake I see in every time I see I work with a student in St. Louis. They forget to look at the side, and so they got the sloping down that looks like this, and it looks like a woman's hairline. That's transgender work, which I do as well. But not you don't want to transgender someone that's wanting to say a man. Um, so look, this is something else I, I've come up with is thinking about this as a three-dimensional model because I find when I draw a hairline, patients go, you know, it still looks crooked in the mirror. I go, it does, and the reason for this is that. The hairline is actually the scalp topography. Fl when it flattens, the hairline looks off. So what looks correct in 3D doesn't look good in 2D. So you want to marry those two things. It also is a great cross check when you're starting out. You draw a line that you feel pretty confident is straight. Then you have the patient close their eyes so they don't freak out when you, your hairline looks like this. And you look and you go, wow, wait a second, it's off. Because it immediately takes all the weird 3D topography and gives you a straight 2D view of your work and gives you feedback. So summary of this and I'm going to go through a, a clinical scenario, is get that shingle point, then draw your lateral endpoints, design the shape of it, check from the lateral view that it slopes up or is flat, check your temples that they match, and then check for symmetry in the mirror. Okay? So this is the shingle point on a guy. This is showing you three proposed hairlines, which is right, which is correct. Well, the first one is too low, right? It's on the vertical scalp. Second one's at the shingle point, but maybe could it go a little bit farther back? It could, potentially. Maybe you'll lose the frame. You gotta look at donor capacity, et cetera. The last one I think is too high because it's not doing anything for him. It's not gonna give him a frame. So then the lateral canthus, the easiest thing to do is take, when you're starting out, use, use a little uh, eyebrow pencil because that will help you make sure that you're gonna stay on target. And then measure things. It helps you measure because your eye can fool you sometimes. So it's a marriage of eye and measurements. Let's take a look at the side view. And I'm, I'm Having done this hair course for eight years now, it's taught me everything that a student does wrong. And it gives me better feedback of how to teach better. And so look at number one. If you look at one, that if that's these are all sort of, it looks like it's along the temporal. Actually, one is not in the temporal hairline. It's, it's too far lateral, OK? Two is on the temporal hairline, but you have to build this massive temple to match. I don't know if my, my pointer works. You have to build this massive point that fits here, right? Three works because you have a, a, a conservative temple, and four, you don't have to even build a temple, but is that correct? The three and four are probably the right answers, but here's the dotted line to show you what I'm talking about. One is too far lateral, it's not correct, okay? Two is just, it doesn't look right, you know? You gotta build, it's obviously even sloping down. Three and four are correct, and, and my one lesson for those that are starting out in hair is never build a temple because it's the hardest thing to do right. You get these weird hairs that stick out, and you think you're doing it right, but I, and I can tell you half the battle is good staff doing it right, and it's very hard to place, very hard to design. Stay away from temples your first five years. So we'll go back and just show the, the, the three points looking down, okay, and, and then from the side view, looking at it, making sure it slopes up, and then I start to draw the hairline a little bit, looking at it, finish, draw out the hairline a little bit more. Then I, I shape it. Those are two shape patterns. One's a little bit rounder and one's a little more suppressed. This is a top-down view you can see. Um, the suppression, it makes it a little more natural. I look from the frontal view and then I look at the mirror view, just checking at both sides. And then I look at the side views, making sure they slope. Okay, so that's, that's basically some ideas here. And let's talk about donor harvesting. What is a safe donor area? A safe donor area is an area that is not genetically programmed for loss. Well, you don't know what that is when you have a 20-year-old. Because if they're rapidly losing hair, you can almost bet that it's going to be very narrow. And you, what you want to look for is clues. If they're, if they're starting to have miniaturization in their donor hair, like what's called retrograde loss coming up, they're having very 
small area of potential harvesting that's available. So be careful with that. Um, and then look at areas um, in terms of the shape. It's just above the ear, a few centimeters above the ear, and then uh, uh, along where the mastoid is, going down along where the occipital protuberance is. If you go below that, you're really into neck skin. And if you go above that, you can't. But you just don't want to go below that. And the higher you go up, the closer you're going into the crown and the more risk. So when we're planning the donor area, here's an example. If you just expand that area from th uh, 30 square centimeters more, and that's what's shown in this diagram, you're at just a few centimeters more, you're increasing your graft count by a huge number. So stay more conservative in your, in your hairline design, but not so conservative that you lose that frame. Now, how do you actually calculate? How do I know how many, how many sites to make in a, in a, in a, in a, in a transplant? Let's, you use a densitometer, you, you calculate about 80 follicular units per square centimeter in this patient. Let's say you're taking about one centimeter, which is an average width. You, and for you, I would really go as narrow as possible. Don't go too wide because you're going to have tension. Um, let's say 25 centimeters in length. You're going to calculate about 2,000 follicular units uh, on average. So if, let's say you have this, this case where you've got thick and thin going on. You want to take an average of that. So let's say four centimeters is what you harvest out. You, you cut out that four centimeters, and let's say you pull 54 one hairs, you pull two, uh, 222 hairs, and you pull 62 three hairs. That gives you 337 follicular units. If that's four centimeters, and you have a 24 centimeter segment, all you got to do is multiply by six, right? Then you know your total calculated number. That projected number is what I use to design my recipient sites. And so I first thing I want to do is pull out a segment that my staff can dissect and calculate for me so that I get an, a graft estimation. And as I progress through the recipient sites, they refine that number and I adjust my numbers as I progress. So that's how I, I, I work with this. And a huge part of recipient site design is don't put all your thousand right here and you go, whoops, I'm, I can't finish the area. So I train people in St. Louis in my course how to make, just repeatedly make sure that those numbers that you came up with will fit the site design that you created so you don't run out halfway through. Okay, and that's just practice. That's all it is. Um, and it's preparing the donor site through shaving it down. We leave a, a couple millimeters, and the reason is you want to see how the hair is, is coming, emanating from the skin. That's a hair curl, and that helps you orient the graft. But that's really beyond what I'm going to talk about. This, you know, I could talk for half a day, as you can see, and that's really on, on the assistance side, which is so critical to have good assistance. And, that's half a day of lectures, which I'm not going to get into. So you start with the, the lidocaine ring block, you know, about 20 cc's around, just inferior to the area that you're working. And then that's the anterior ring block. And then when you, before you harvest, you want to put enough tumescence in. Tumescence is so critical. Tumescence of, with just dilute epi saline allows you to create safety. What does safety mean? Well, the, the coral are the nerve and blood supply. The, the ship is your blade. And so if you raise it at high tide when you harvest, you don't damage things. Because I have patients from across the world and ta across other places that have had harvesting with bad tumescence and sloppy harvesting. They've got occipital nerve injury. In fact, tomorrow I'm, I'm trying to Botox nerve damage from a, a patient who just had it done and, and, and it's bad work. I mean, it's just not protecting nerve and blood supply. So take your time in the harvest. This is not a a two-minute harvest. So people that come and watch me are welcome to come and watch me. Don't all come in one day. Um, it's it's going to be really, you'll see how much care I take in the harvest of this. And this is showing you high and low tide. Heart tumescence is so important. The old method was just taking a syringe and, and injecting it. Now I use um, this injecting gun that just speeds things along and allows minimal needle stick injury. And this is just showing you uh, injecting it with this little uh, gun. I put in about 150 cc's, 100 cc's, 150 cc's on average. There are d different ways to harvest. The classic way in the textbook is a single blade. Um, you can also do what's, you can use a d double blade where you're just scoring the bottom edge to, to make sure you have a uniform width. And then uh, th this is showing you just with a single scoring blade there. You can also harvest with a double blade. Uh, and, the, and, and this is showing a double blade here. The, the, the real thing with this is when you're starting out, I recommend using a single blade, and double blades are risky. And so what I've actually developed now is the way I do it today is I use a double blade, double scoring. So what I do is I just score both, and then I come back and single blade harvest so that my width is uniform. Why is the width uniformity so important? A few reasons. Number one is the graph calculation is dead on accurate. If I'm a little bit off by a few millimeters, my graph count is way off. So I want uniform uh, harvest. 
Also, I know that my, my tension will be off. If I'm slightly off in there, I went to 1.3 centimeters when I met 1.1, and then I'm stuck with trying to close. So you, you want accuracy. So this double scoring method followed by single harvest is, is really helpful. And when you'd harvest, you really want to be very slow with the harvest. And this is literally how slow I'm in my harvest. I'm constantly looking for one word, transection. Transection is, is destruction of grafts. It leads to poor wound healing. So people think good wound closure is how you put, throw that needle through and put the suture in. No. Good wound closure, besides tension-free, is minimal transection. What, how do you minimize transection? Well, this is, I knew I can memorize this, but as I'm harvesting, if I see the bulbs on the bottom portion of, of the, um, the, the transection being in the bottom portion, the bulbs, I'm going to slightly raise my, my, my blade handle. If I'm seeing the upper shafts being cut, I'm going to slowly lower the blade. And so that's what, why it takes so slow slow a process through the harvesting and I'm constantly readjusting as I'm harvesting really really slow harvesting and that's important so minimizing transection you should see very bloodless plain I take out my cautery once a year or once every other year and you should be able to see that there's just very little transection during the harvest then basically very simple I'm not going to bore you too much with this you just finish the ends uh, you measure your two centimeter segment for graph calculations and then you go ahead and just close, uh, harvest the, the strip out, do a little trichophytic closure if there is not tension. And the trichophytic closure is to allow the, wound, the, the hairs to grow through the, the wound. And this is just showing a schematic of this so the hairs grow through. You guys know this probably from brow work. And then take out any debris. I put a little pour, play, uh, pour plasma in, decrease and align the wound edges with towel clamps. And this is just showing the whole wound with towel clamps. And then if I need to, high rondes, which is, it should not be a good escape valve. It's something that you should plan for that you almost never use this. And then a distal air knot so that the, so the knot doesn't get in the wound and bother the patient. And then you want to grab about mid follicle depth and you're taking it about 45 degree angle here so that the skin pull is vertical coming down. And this is just putting um, a little bit of extra PPP at the end uh, to help with wound healing. Um, and now they've shown that the bioactivity of PPP is almost similar to PRP, so I use that for the wound. I put a, a bupivacaine block at the end, about 20 cc's, uh, to fin finish off the site. Now, core of the lecture, recipient site design. Why is this, why, this is why hair is fun, okay? So clearly this is old style, horrible work that you don't want to be looking at anymore, and that you deadly look at that and go, my God, this stands out as na nastiness. But here is some subtle bad work. If you look at this, this is a, a correction I did where a patient, it sort of looks like pubic hair, I hate to say that, but because the grafts have been over manipulated by the staff. And there's too large a hair graft count in the front, the angles are poor, the hairline is too straight, there's a lack of density, and they don't match the temple. Besides that, it's great. And this is all post-plug era. This is not even plugs. These are bad, this is bad, subtly bad work that looks like a terrible result. If you have the eye to see it, you start to see it, it's not good. What is wrong with this one? Well, here's the problem, there's pitting. If you look at it, it looks like a plug because what happened was, there's two things, there's compression and pitting, and the hairline's too straight, and the temples don't match, and there's lack of density. But the idea is that the grafts are three or four hair grafts placed in the hairline. What is this guy smoking? And it's now compressed into looking like a plug. It's not 16 hairs, this is three hairs, compressed down, and then it slid into the site. And when it slides in, at the end, the graft has got to sit about a millimeter or two above of the surface skin. If it sits flush, it will sink, and then it'll cause a pit. And if it's pitted, it looks horrible. And this is a, is a and also the temples don't match. Um, and this is hairs that look like picket fence. So when I teach you the recipient side design, you'll see in the body positioning of the patient so important. The angles have to, got to be super low. If they're up like this, they look like a picket fence. So you can't angle your grafts almost too low. You can easily make them too high. And when I teach those students, watching them with their hands move, I see they constantly go too high. You've got to go 30 degrees, 20 degrees when you're making that hairline. And of course, too large a graph in the front hairline, too straight, doesn't match temple, back, lack of density, all the bad stuff that are there. And all this is post-plug era. So I go back and encourage you, know the Norwood system. And this is the topography I showed you from a box perspective, but just defined in more natural terms on a scalp. So don't memorize all this right now. Just understand you need to know scalp topography when you're designing your work. And the reason for it is that when you look at this, the, the, the way you design these sites, they're all different based on where you're going on, on a scalp. And so here is an example on a, on a real person. You can see that 
for the frontal hairline all goes straight and only at the lateral area for the temple do the, does the area start to cascade down. And really, you don't want any abrupt angles. When you're designing recipient sides, it doesn't go from here to there. You'll never see that on a human scalp. It's a slow sweep. Everything is a gradual transition. And so when you start to see that, you understand that that's a vital component to recipient design. And also, from a lateral perspective, the angles, and angles define, you'll see that in the next slide, as, as uh, AP going up and down, changes, goes up, up, up to the crown, then back, back, back down. So everything in nature, there's gradual transition, side to side, up and down, no abrupt angles, no abrupt changes. And the, ang the terms we use in the hair world, angles refer to the uh, up and down uh, uh, anterior posterior direction, direction refers to this way, and then tilt refers to the, 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 the angulation in that regard. So I go, go back and bring you to the, the, to the box idea because that's how we define everything. So there's many ways to make sites. I don't make micro punches anymore because sometimes there's vascular issues with that. I use uh, parallel and, and coronal sites. I will show you how I use them and, and why. But essentially, a, a sagittal site is the, w is the easiest way to do it because it's easier for you to design. It, it follows natural hair angles. Um, sorry, the way natural hair grows. Um, but the problem with it is since it's sagittally based, sometimes the graph can slide up a little bit so you can be more vertical. The coronal ones, if, they, if you have a three hair graft, and just play sagittally, think of the hair going in like this versus like this. The hairs splay a little bit, create a little bit more shingle or awning on the, on the scalp. So I use those for creative purposes, but I also use them so my staff will know what's a two-hair site and a three-hair site. Does that make sense? So they know, they go, oh, that's a three-hair site, it's a coronal site. Um, so just to show you some design work is, you know, when you do, you probably have, have used like the Gunter diagrams for rhinoplasty at the end, or you, you, so you know what you did for rhinoplasty. Well, I do a, a Gunter style di diagram, if you will, for, for hair. So I know when I come back and look at my results, how, where did I place everything? You know? And that's important. So here's a, a hairline that looks very natural. And then this is show, they're all angled forward. And as you see, angle forward to the temple, and all of a sudden, a slow transition going down. Um, this is showing you the, 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 the beginning of a, of a crown where the whorl is going up and to the side and down. There are no abrupt transitions. Even going up to the back of the scalp, everything transitions well. This is a female hairline, again, very smooth transitions, nothing abrupt. This is showing you a gentleman that had enough vellus hairs where it had a little whorl pattern, so I whirled it up to the front, just slightly different. This is showing you a temple pattern, and, and so these are just showing you different shapes that can be there. And these are, I usually use 18, 19, and 20 gauge needles, three, two, and one hair respectively for, for that. Unlike the tumescence in the back of the scalp, I sequentially tumescence, slowly tumesce, slowly tumesce, because the, it will constantly recede. And why you tumesce? Same thing. Lack of vascular injury allows you less bleeding, um, preservation of tissue as you're doing it. And I always measure my graft to site fit. So before I start making a thousand sites that don't fit, I make sure I do one or two sites, test each size, make sure that they fit, make sure my staff are dissecting to fit the site so they don't make chubby grafts that don't fit or skinny grafts, and then all of a sudden we're at the end of the case and nothing fits, or you get pitting because of that. So you've got, these are the esoterica that yes, you won't remember anything I tell you, but you're gonna remember, oh my God, there's a lot of details in this that are not just stick hairs in there, you know? And maybe this will guide you if you're doing a scar repair case in your residency, you'll think, okay, there's a lot of things I gotta think about. For example, people think, oh, eyebrows. I'll start with eyebrows. No, you need to end with eyebrows. Eyebrows are very hard to do right. It's very hard to do right for the surgeon and it's really hard to do right for the assistant's placing. I use my best placers when I'm doing the, when I'm doing the, the eyebrow because it's very, very hard. So the patient being supine is really critical because that way, look at how easy my hand angles low. If they're sitting up like I do for the crown where I want them high, my ang hair angle, my, my hand naturally goes too high. So I want it very, very low um, for, the, for the anterior hairline. And then I make sagittal sites. This is just showing you a, a two second video. I'm just making these sagittal sites here. And we'll go forward. And this is just showing you how I make coronal sites. I mean, pretty obvious, but just to show you. And I'm now mixing. You see those are coronal sites be behind my sagittals. So I draw the hairline. I first make a first pass of one hair. I, I regularize, regularize that line. Then I come back and I'm not happy with it. I constantly finesse and tighten and regularize further that line. Then I come back a third time and say, I want to regularize it more. I'm still not happy that I'm making sentinel hairs. That's a natural hairline. You got these little one hairs sticking out. Then I come back and say, I need to make it more irregular. Because the more irregular you make it, the more natural it is. Then I start building my hair lines, my two hairs, more two hair sites, and then I, especially in the, in the frontal temporary recession, and then I build my three hair sites 
And that's just a quick schematic of, of how I design everything. This is showing you in, in, in a real case scenario after drawing the hairline, drawing, doing some one hair sites, building up my one hair sites, building up more one to two, and then building up two to three, and then here are my threes. So these are just constantly building uh, the pattern. So think of a shoreline. It's irregularly irregular. Think of AFib. It's irregularly irregular. So th these are just uh, a, a, a mixture of sagittal and coronals, coronals in the temple. And this is just showing you a mixture of sagittal coronals again. And this is the art artistry of making a beautiful hair work, sagittal coronal work, and a full temple work, all sagittal. And this is sagittal coronal. So this is, this is a, and, and also you can see there's a slight convergence pattern where they, because the scalp is on a round, uh, round topography, so you want them angled slightly in. And all these esoterica are not meant for you to remember. It's just to show you that it's complex. It's not just making sites. And these are, again, some, uh, diagrams to show you how I, I record my distribution um, of where I place sites and, and, and I actually print this and put it up on the wall for my staff to follow so they know, okay, this is where I placed everything, this is my distribution. So one more lecture. I could do one on PRP at the end if you guys are not super bored, but I, I think this is probably enough information for the morning. Last uh, lectures on FUE versus FUT. You know, you hear on the internet, this is the stuff you see. Don't do a linear scar. Well, this is clearly, you heard all the bad things. When I was doing donor harvesting, I showed you how do you, how, why do you get bad scars? Because of technique. Just like why do you get a bad rhinoplasty? It has a lot to do with technique, right? And so this is where I'm trying to have you understand the internet hype. Well, you don't see the other side. Well, you can get scars. It's not, nothing scarless. FUE, you can have little dots. And if someone says, you know, I want to have FUE so I can shave my head, well, you can't. Okay, 75% incidence of some degree of hypopigmentation, no matter what your ethnicity is, it's not scarless, okay? So it's important that you just cut the hype out and not see only half the picture, which is just the donor area, because harvesting methods are important, but the result is what do you get when you have a transplant? So what is, what is exactly safe? Well, we have to define that. We talked about the safe donor area, and with FUE, you have to go wider because it's contracting down. And you have to be careful because if you're going way up into the corner register of everything, like you're going up to the top, and you've got a guy that his crown is starting to come down, he's 25 years old, what are you doing? You're taking unsafe hair, right? That's hair that's, that genetically is probably not programmed for, for safety, it's probably programmed for loss. So think about that, and FUT has a distinct advantage is that you're going down way into the safe area and staying within the safe area. So sometimes you combine both, and sometimes you use one or the other. So how do you make a distinction of when do you do one or the other? And so remember that when all you have is a hammer, the whole world is a nail, right? So you need to use the tools in your belt to do the right thing, and I really encourage you, if you're going to the hair wool, consider to be an expert in FUE and FUT. Don't just say, well, all I do is FUT, all I do is FUE, because there's so many indications. I do FUE and FUT every week, because I look at the clinical indication and help someone guide them, guide them the right answer. So how do you, what do I do? So if I'm using a slightly smaller um, case, fewer than 2,000 grafts, you know, pa patient that wears their hair relatively short, has a little bit li li limited li loss, they're a great FUE candidate, okay? But if someone has got extensive loss, where I'm moving a mega session of 3,000 hairs plus, and they've got baldness from the front to the back, and they've got their crown in this unsafe area, FUE will blow out this donor hair. He won't have any donor hair left. And if he's got, like, my hair, my hair doesn't shingle well. It goes straight back like this. And if I do a strip in here, I'll see it. These, all these subtle esoterica are things you've got to think about. So here's a case where I'm not going to do an FUE. If he begs me, I'll do it, but it's stupid. Okay, I mean, let's not cut through the marketing hype. He needs a mega session of FUT. And this guy, there's no way I'm gonna do an FUT on him or a strip procedure because it's gonna look insane. Well, this guy doesn't need to have hair loss, but my point of this is, <laughs> yeah, that's stupid either way, right? But my point of this is just to show you this kind of, this kind of is what I'm dealing with. And, and so the other thing that's important is FUE has fragile grafts. You gotta treat them so differently, and that's a whole nother lecture of how to treat FUE grafts, but there are more skeletonized, more fragile, you, there's not as much agnexa, you, you, you have to have minimal ex vivo time, and now with regenerative medicine uh, as a tease, ATP and PRP, sorry, ATP and hypothermosol can leave grafts in ex vivo for two weeks in a refrigerator with 96% survival, whereas the past your ex vivo time is 
12 hours to 14 hours before you start having some degradation of, of your survival. That's pretty cool. I harvest beer the night before and I transplant it after, like if they're burned out, I'll take mini strips. I'll do a beer the night before, harvest that so that I have a full day. The next day I'll do the strip, graph calculate, and place in the afternoon. But the, my beer grafts are sitting in, in ATP hypothermosol and I've got great results where they survive. And so FUE, this is to show you right after the procedure immediately post. This is just showing you very quickly uh, day out. It heals so fast, and this is a great thing. Seven days out, you don't even know anything happened. I use it, as you saw earlier, to repair linear scars. FUE is great for that. This is a weird case, is a gentleman, and it's not a perfect result. I came back and did a second session, but he's from out of town, so I, I, I don't think this result is great, but understand where he's coming from. He's got burned out donor hair. He's got nothing left to harvest, whether it's FUE or FUT. You say, well, why can't I do more FUE back here? Because it's gonna look moth-eaten. You're gonna look like patches lost. So you can't just FUE everyone, even if they have no you know, scalp tension, I mean, even if they have a lot of scalp tension and you can't do an FUT, you probably can't do an FUE either because they're gonna look like scars visible and nothing can happen. Then he had leg transplanted to his scalp, he had, um, he had beard transplanted from another doctor, nothing worked for him. So I was very confident in my skills, we came back and it worked for him. I think part of his technique and part of it is my regenerative medicine that I use. And so this is one session where he's not perfect, but it's better. It's, and this is like five failed attempts, and this is one, one successful result. So I, I always mention this. Again, I make no money on my books. Uh, this is the only FUE book ever written that's, you know, it's definitive out there. Four volumes set, I just rewrote volume one. My assistant, uh, Mina, who's an MD from another country, wrote, rewrote volume two. So these are all new that just came out. Encourage you for, I have some brochures up somewhere here I, for my hair course in early September. It's intensely hands-on. Um, I really don't believe that. If you come and watch me for a week, you'll learn this much. If I watch you for five minutes, I'll learn that much. And you'll be able to correct your mistakes within one hour. I, I almost guarantee it because you guys are smart. I look at where your hands are not, because you don't know what your hands are doing, right? Your first. I just use rhinoplasty again. If your first rhinoplasty, you don't know what the hell you're doing. It looks so easy when you're attending, did it? And you start the first case, you know what the heck you're doing. Like, what the heck? This is hard. The septum, you look at your tendon and go, septum, and then you're like, oh my God, the first septum's a nightmare. <laughs> yes, when you, hair is the same way. It looks so easy just making some sites. I have patients, people come and watch me. Oh, you're just making holes. No, you need to, I need to watch you <laughs> do the work and I will know where your flaw is. I'll count the flaw, I'll say your major problem is density. Then I'll come up, so Socratically bring up the melon head, which is our, my, the model. I'll walk up to five students and say, what's wrong with this? They'll go, uh, one will get it right. I say, yeah, it's density. Density is not even. So I'll walk around and show the density. What's wrong with this? Okay, the angle's all over the place. What's wrong with this one? Depth is wrong. So I'm looking for all these things, and so I really believe hands-on is the way to teach. You just cannot listen to, at, at any level of, well, I should say this, at beginner level, I need to see you work. I, you cannot watch me work, I've gotta watch you work. And that's where the, the learning is. One more plug, no pun intended, uh, is the fall meeting, October 6 through, uh, 6 through 8 in Nashville. Just for those people that have not been to a fall meeting in years because a, B, C, I'm gonna tell you all those reasons are gone. First reason people don't go to fall meeting because there's too much non-educational garbage. I've taken all that and shrunk it down to nothing. Look at the program, I have one there. You can take these, these are all for you. Um, the it's the, the non-educational stuff is shrunk down to almost nothing, okay? There's not three hours of awards, it's five minutes, all right? Too bad if you won one. Number two is, it, you remember in Dallas, if you guys came here, how confusing things were where you went from planet A to planet B to get somewhere and you realized planet B's lecture was bad and you gotta figure out go to planet C. Now all four rooms are across the hall from each other. I've, now I realize some people only do rhinoplasty, some people only do aging face. I've got three days of rhinoplasty, three days of aging face, um, three days of practice management, all color coded. And you, if you don't like one lecture, walk across the hall. I've also made, I've cut down, I've eliminated ICs. They don't exist anymore. You, if you can't give a message in 15 minutes, sorry, this is a long one, that uh, you can't deliver a message. I want you to take pearls home in 15 minutes. So I've, everything has shrunk down to seven to 15 minute lectures. Uh, the, and and we're, we're doing the launch party for Vobella, national launch party for Vobella. We're gonna do some fun offsite work they're sponsoring on Saturday night. So if you're coming, stay Saturday night, have fun. It's gonna be an awesome program. So I always say what's really important is you don't know if you want to do hair. I'm here to excite you. I'm not here to give you all the details. You don't remember a single thing I said, and that's normal. What I want you to remember is that hair is fun. Hair is, is technical. Hair is an amazing feel that you can get into if, if you st start with passion and vision with everything. Thank you.